This video is the first in a series of videos where I will explain the basic concept behind the Neyman Pearson paradigm for hypothesis testing. So first quickly recall what is meant by hypothesis testing. Here we have got two different possibilities. Suppose I take this simple example. I have my hand and there is a little tumor in my hand and I am wondering whether this tumor is cancerous or not cancerous. So these are the two possibilities, either there is cancer or there is no cancer. Two possible truths. They cannot happen simultaneously and one of them must happen, mutually exclusive and exhaustive. Now how do I figure that out? Well, I have to go to the doctor. And the doctor will diagnose it again either as yes you have cancer and no you do not have cancer. So I get this 2 by 2 table. Here I am showing the truth and here I am showing the diagnosis. Cancer versus no cancer. And that gives rise to these four possibilities. And these four possibilities are like this. I do have cancer and the doctor says I have cancer. Or I do not have cancer and the doctor correctly diagnoses that I do not have cancer. In both these cases, the diagnosis is correct. Now, there are two possible types of mistakes that might happen. I do have cancer, but the doctor wrongly thinks that I do not have cancer. Or I do not have cancer, but the doctor wrongly thinks that I do have cancer. Now, the question is, how should I make? this diagnosis in a way such that these errors have small, have a low probability of occurring. So that is the main idea of test of hypothesis. So you are given two possibilities and based on data, whatever data, maybe some biopsy data, whatever, we want to determine. We want to give a verdict either in favor of cancer or in favor of no cancer such that these errors have low probability of occurrence. So any such procedure, any such procedure which maps data to a binary set of cancer versus no cancer is called a statistical hypothesis testing and we want this to have the desirable property that these errors should not have high probability of occurring. Now, carrying out this thing, <coughs> this, this test procedure, such that both these types of error have low probability, poses a difficulty. Let's understand this with our example of a cancer treatment <coughs> or a cancer diagnosis. So, as I said, suppose I am having this tumor and the doctor is really trying to guard against, say, this error. That is, if I have cancer and the doctor by mistake misses that, that is a dreaded error and the doctor tries to guard against that. Now, if that is the only thing to guard against, the answer will be very easy. The doctor will merely say, whatever patient comes to him, yes, you have cancer. So, you just diagnose everyone as a cancer patient, then you are sure that you are never going to commit this mistake. But that will be one extreme. When you do that, you are making the probability of this error very high. In fact, the probability of this error will become 1. Because whenever a patient comes to you which is no cancer, you are definitely going to say cancer. So for any such patient, you are definitely going to commit this error. So if this error probability is 0, then that error probability is 1. And if you are a very conservative kind of doctor, then possibly you do not always say <coughs> no cancer, but you say no cancer most of the time. Then again, you are making this probability pretty close to zero, which means this probability will go pretty close to one. So whenever you try to reduce it, this one goes up. And the opposite thing also holds. So if you are always saying, oh, don't worry about that. <coughs> Uh, so, whenever anyone comes to you, you just say, no, don't worry about that, that, that cancer, etc., just fictitious disease, you have no cancer. In that case, you are guarding against this thing. 
you are sure that you are never going to diagnose a, pan, a patient without cancer as cancer but then this probability becomes one so either this is high or that is high and that is a problem which always plagues us so we want to reduce both these error probabilities unfortunately if you try to put one down the other goes up and that is the problem that these two people Neiman and Pearson set out to solve Now the way Neiman Pearson set out to attack this problem is like this. I will illustrate the entire thing using our familiar example. So what they did was the following. <clears throat> they say that look at the two possible errors that can happen. So you have got these two possible errors. They so said start by diagnosing which error is the more important, more serious for you. In this case, for example, you will all agree that this is the more serious error. I have cancer in my hand and the doctor says that there is no cancer. So I might be happy initially, but eventually I am going to die. On the other hand, what does this error say? It says I have no cancer, so I have really nothing to fear about, but the doctor tells me, no, I think you have cancer, so possibly I'll have to go to radiotherapy, etc., spend some money, but at the end of the day, I am safe. <clears throat> so I just spend some unnecessary amount of money, that is the only bad thing, but I am still alive. So this is the error that is more serious. So the error that is more serious, they say that you call that one type 1 error and the error that is less serious, you call it type 2 error. <clears throat> now the truth corresponding to the type 1 error that is cancer, they suggested that you call it by this name, you call it H0, H for hypothesis and H0, so that is the null hypothesis. So if you are in doubt, you would rather give your verdict in favor of H0. Like in this case, if the doctor is not sure, the doctor should better say, well, get yourself treated for cancer. <clears throat> so type 1 error should be avoided by all means. So H0 is your favored hypothesis. That is your pet hypothesis. If in doubt, go for H0. Now, as a result, we, <coughs> of course, we call the other one H1, that is the alternative hypothesis. And so the diagnosis also is now level in terms of the null hypothesis. So instead of saying, I want to go for H0, we call accept H0. And I want to go for H1, that is called reject H0. Now, you have to understand this carefully. So when I say accept H0, there are two possibilities. One is, I have got clear evidence in favor of H0. Or, I really am undecided, but since type 1 error is more dangerous, so to be on the safe side, I have taken H0 as the default option. So, I may accept H0 because of these two reasons. One is, I have clear evidence in favor of it, or I am using it as the default. So, it is like this. Suppose there is uh, some, uh, some murder committed and I have been convicted as a potential murderer and there are of course uh, various evidences for and against me and it turns out that none of these evidences are actually very convincing. Then what does the judge do? Now our Indian constitution and the constitution of many other countries also have this provision which is called benefit of doubt. So if there is a problem, if there is this problem of not being able to make up your mind, in that case, you give the accused person benefit of doubt. So by default, you assume that the accused person is innocent. So when some accused person is allowed to go scot-free, this does not mean that his innocence has been established. This basically means that the truth of the accusation could not be proved. 
It could be that innocence has been established. It could be that we do not have conclusive evidence in either direction. But when someone says that I reject H0, that clearly means that yes, I have found strong evidence against H0. Only then I am going to reject H0 because H1 is not our favored hypothesis. Now, having said this, I might also add that in certain other countries like Nepal, there the rule is just the opposite. They do not have this benefit of doubt thing. There they say something like this, that the onus of the proof is on the accused. That is, if no conclusive evidence will be found in either side, in that case the accused person will be considered guilty by default. And that is why <coughs> if some criminal seeks refuge in Nepal and they can somehow nab him there on the pretext of even a minor thing, it is easier to <coughs> it is easier to prove him guilty in Nepal than in India. And at least one such criminal called Charles Shovaraj was nabbed precisely in this way. So he was nabbed in Nepal because there he could not prove that he was innocent and that was enough to prove, quote unquote proof, that he was the guilty person. But the same thing could not be done in India. Okay, so, <coughs> so Neiman Pearson, what they suggested is this. So I will go into the details in a subsequent video, but the basic idea is this. You first try to control your type 1 error probability. So only consider those tests where the probability of committing type 1 error is below a pre-specified threshold, say something like 5% or 10%. So you do not want to make it exactly equal to 0 because that will typically force probability of type 2 error to shoot up to 1. So you allow some probability of type 1 error, then among all those tests, all the tests where probability of type 1 error is less than that threshold, you look for that test which will maximize, uh, rather minimize probability of type 2 error. So that was the prescription that Neyman Pearson gave. So far I have not said how you really execute this. They just gave a way to attack the problem of having to reduce both these things and they cannot be reduced simultaneously. So how should I at all attack the problem? they gave one way by which you can try to attack the problem. Then they followed it up with some actual implementation which gave rise to the Neyman-Pearson lemma that we will take up in the next video.